How are you doing today, Dom? Doing really great. I'm looking forward to the interview, guys. Okay, so I guess we should start out with uh, an introduction on you. Tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into uh, controlled dice shooting and, uh, and all that. Well, sure. You know, uh, I'm 67. So maybe about oh, 42 years ago, uh, when I was uh, uh, in New York City and trying to start uh, my uh, software company that I still own, uh, I needed a way to make uh, some extra money to support my family as I was out there cold calling and trying to get accounts. Uh, and so because of the math background that I have, uh, degrees in that in, in math and stuff, sciences, uh, I decided and I love the game, I love cards played cards as a little kid with my grandfather sitting on his lap, one of my most cherished pictures I own. Um, I uh, learned how to count cards. And I could cut, count down a deck of cards in about 11 seconds. And I'd go to Atlantic City on a, uh, a day trip, take a bus, they'd give you a $5 coupon, they gave you some food and some other stuff like that. And I'd come uh, back home with 35 or 40 bucks in cash. And back then, 40 some odd years ago, 41, 42 years ago, that was a hell of a lot of money. And I was, you know, a full uh, gas in my tank, some food, and maybe even a pizza on Friday night. And as that, uh, as I kept on doing that, you know, I had a very small bankroll. I practiced for about six months and built up a bankroll, maybe about 150 bucks. But back then, you know, the games that were in Atlantic City were uh, 25 cent games, dollar games in blackjack. You know, it's a di different time period. So as, as the years went on, my bankroll grew, and I had friends that asked me uh, to teach them. They wanted to learn how to count. And so I did. So I have t started to have teams around the country. Now, as the game of blackjack uh, changed in the sense of casinos trying to take every nickel and dime from the players by changing rules, by changing penetration, by just a ton of different things in, in blackjack, I looked at the game of craps as another game in the casino that could be beat with some uh, learning and practice. And the reason why I looked at that game as a game that could be beat, because basically all we're doing in the game of craps is throwing dice. So we have a moving projectile that goes into the air and lands. So uh, with my physics background, I looked at the uh, game of crafts as just a <laughs> physics problem. It's a moving projectile in the air. And uh, any moving projectile in the air goes through what they call six degrees of freedom. And uh, because I was a pretty good athlete as a kid, a uh, piano player, so I had real good tactile fingers and uh, could really, I built model planes and um, just a lot of different things. My, my tactile feel was really pretty good and so was my hand-eye coordination. And so I looked at it and said, okay, well, if I could reduce the amount of sevens that is thrown randomly by throwing the dice a certain way, the same way all the time and reduce three of those six degrees of freedom, this game could be beat, you know, because blackjack and craps are really the only game in the casino that can be beat with um, some skill. Uh, blackjack, is, as far as a card counter, and dice, craps, because the game is in your hands. It's in the shooter's hands. You know, they're well, and, be... and I, I would think that the very low house edges on those games help as well, too. Well, exactly right. And that, and that goes into just the way you're going to bet on this game. So I asked my dad and don't mean to bore you with the story, but I asked my dad to uh, build me what I call a little practice rate. And I started fooling around with dice sets and, and throwing and, and uh, all this sort of stuff. And uh, that's the way this whole thing really started for me. And then, you know, there were other people around the country uh, that uh, were doing the same sort of thing for whatever reasons they were. And I got involved with them as well. We, through a mutual friend that passed on right now, he uh, introduced me to uh, uh, other dice controllers. And uh, this whole thing became uh, a revolution, I like to say. Uh, we just noticed that people that took care with the dice just seemed to have longer extended roles. 
instead of just taking them up and whipping them down the, the table. If you just took some care with them um, and tried to throw them the same way, uh, you could beat the game with proper betting. And that's huh. it. That's how I got started. Okay, let me interject here. So, so basically, you know, there's a lot of people who don't believe in, in dice control. It, it's been around for a while. It used to be called rhythmic rolling many years Absolutely. ago, and, and now it's called dice control. And through the years, I mean, it's, it's a very controversial subject. So, so what we're trying to do today is you, you have some success at this. You, you teach the class. There's been a couple of, uh, you mentioned a couple of TV shows. Actually, one of them was, was on the History Channel. It, it, it was about you personally, your success at this. So you are someone who has been successful at this, but there are other people who, who, who doubt how well it works. So this is something we want to take a look at today. And, and, and like you say, so, so on average, it's once every six rolls, a seven comes up, correct? That so, is correct. So, so just, if, if you can just change it so it, it comes up less often, uh, you would statistically get, it, get an edge at the game, correct? That is the whole idea behind it. Yeah, because a lot of a lot of people, I think, I think a lot of people sort of have a misunderstanding about it. A lot of people think that if you're some great controlled dice shooter, you can pick up the dice and throw throw a box cards, throw a double six every right. time, and you get right. paid thirty to one, thirty one to one, right. whatever it is, depending on the casino. And that's not exactly uh, how it works. I believe the term I see uh, thrown around a lot is you're trying to statistically depress the number of sevens, correct? That is correct. You know, I get that a lot. I'll have people call me and the students, can you teach me how to throw a 12 all the time? No, pal. <laughs> I can't teach you how to throw a 12 all the time. You know, Mickey Mantle didn't go up to bat and hit a home run every time he got to hit a baseball. The idea behind what we do is exactly what you said, Steve, and what you said, Matt, and that is we're trying to reduce the presence of a seven and if we can reduce it uh against random then we can beat the game i mean it's just that simple all you have to do is reduce the presence of a seven and you don't have to reduce it by that much it, to beat this game as long as you bet properly now okay. we had mentioned earlier that you were on some uh tv shows right so you did uh i think you had mentioned it there was the history channel and I believe it was about people that uh, beat the casinos for a lot of money. And I believe most of them were cheaters and you were the only one that wasn't a cheater, correct? Yeah, you know, I mean, I'll uh, tell you a little about that as well. But, you know, people can look me up. I'm actually listed as the eighth best gambler of all time. The people ahead of me have all passed on. So I think I should move up in that list since I'm still alive and kicking. But uh, the, uh, you know, I, the History Channel did a full documentary on me. They had a six or maybe it wasn't a uh, ten. A series called Breaking Vegas, and every week they did a documentary on another on on somebody. Everybody that they did, except for me and a roulette father and son team out of France, were the only people that weren't cheaters. Uh, everybody else was a cheater who designed uh, uh, slugs for slot machines or whatever. My particular show was the number one show in that series as well as even to this day the dvd of that show uh is the number one selling dvd on the history channel so people began to call me and said hey you know can you teach me and that's how i decided to instead of being underground and undercover to just come forward with it why i was beginning to get banned at a lot of different casinos around the country and i really wanted to show people that and teach people how to beat this game so if i couldn't beat the casino then uh, my students could beat the casino and that's how it started but yeah i mean the, the history channel you know they did an awful lot of research i talked to a lot of people about uh, my credibility and who i am and you know playboy's done interviews uh with me a great article in playboy new york times uh, uh they called me up when uh, uh the lady who had a four and a half hour role, Patricia DeMarco in uh, Borgata about, oh, about eight years ago. That's a funny story as well. But she threw the dice for about four and a half hours. And uh, they called me up because uh, they did an article about her and the situation at, at the Borgata with her. And just uh, so, yeah, I, you know, as far as credibility is concerned, yeah, I, I think I have it all. And I also have four books out there and yeah. 
All right. Well, well, let me ask you this because people are going to say, okay, this guy, he's, he's got this course. He teaches you how to, how to win at craps uh, by trying to control the dice. And, and, and probably all going to say, well, why isn't he out there making a living doing this? So, so what do you say to that? <laughs> Very simply. Uh, I don't think that being a professional gambler, number one, is a good way to make you a, a living. Uh, you know, I have students call me all the time, you know, I just want to you know, do this uh, full time. And my recommendation in it is this. It, this is a great, beating the casinos with advantage play, is a great part-time job. But you never want to get rid of your full-time job with your health insurance and everything else like that. Because going to the casino and trying to make a living will put an awful lot of stress, not only on yourself, but on your family. You're not going to be able to stay in one place, in one city. You're going to have to travel because you are going to get uh, banned, just like the movie 21 with the, you know, the, the card counters. You know, they eventually got caught because they just continued to go to Vegas. And, you know, so you have to travel a lot. It's a great part-time job. You can take money out of the casinos, make a great, um, make a nice part-time living doing that extra income that's coming in, get all the food for free and the comps and all that good stuff like that. But you got your day job always there to pay your rent and your mortgage and your open heart surgery for your dad if you need. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, I know. I was, um, I've always. We, Matt, you and I always say the same thing though. Yeah, people well, have this fantasy that, that yeah. you know, you could be a professional gambler. It's the greatest thing in the world. And it's not. Right. It's, it's really not. Uh -huh. uh, I've had people that have done it. And, and, you know, they were great shooters, students that are great shooters. Uh, and I, I, two people come to my head. One is a female, one is a male. Um, and just blew everything they had because the stress was way too much. They start chasing the, the losses. They, it, just, uh -huh. it, it just changes everything about you. Um, you know, you, you, you got to have a personal life. You have, to, you have to look at this thing and say, you know, I enjoy going to the casinos, number one. I, it's something that I enjoy doing as a person, any person saying that. Now, if I'm going to go there, why should I put my hard-earned money on the line with, that, with a wing and a prayer, hoping that I pull that slot machine and I win a million bucks today. It is not going to happen. But if you enjoy going to a casino and you enjoy that entertainment, which is you know nothing wrong with it, there's over 62 million people that travel to casinos every year in this country. It's a great form of entertainment. You know, it's not when some when you say to somebody nowadays, I'm going to Vegas on a vacation, they don't look at you as being weird anymore. You know, going to Vegas is a lot of fun. The, the casinos are beautiful. The shows are phenomenal. The restaurants, you know, any, anything you want to eat, it's just great stuff. So instead of putting hard earned money on the line and hoping that you win and saying, well, I lost $500, but I had a good time. Well, I don't think losing 500 bucks is a good time. There are ways you can beat this game, any game, it, blackjack or craps. And I teach both and I have books on both simple way of counting cards and, and what I do in dice control. Uh, there, there are things that somebody can do if they enjoy it, enjoy going to a casino with some practice can gain an edge. Listen, if you enjoy golf, a lot of people will take a golf lesson. So if you enjoy going to a casino, then why not take an, or read a book on how to play blackjack better or how to play craps better and avoid all the carnival games that the casinos want you to play that you just can't be. Okay. Now, well, as, as you said earlier, uh, being a professional gambler is not an easy job because it's not like, even if you have an advantage, you're not going to win every single time you go. That's just, it's just how it works. You're going to have bad days. You're going to have good days. So could we talk about uh, some of your uh, examples of <laughs> bad days and good days? Like uh, what is the, uh, but what are some, like the most you've won in a day or the most you've lost in a day, if you don't uh, mind sharing? <laughs> well, you know, I don't talk about dollar amounts, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, I can give you a call. I, well, sure. Um, you know, the, the worst situation I had was I went through 21 straight sessions uh, losing on that day. So sessions meaning I went to the, either the blackjack table or the craps table and I lost money. 21 straight times. Wow. I mean, there were, there were, there in the middle of all that run, I would go back up to my hotel room and stick my 
thumb in my mouth and curl up like a little baby and say, what the hell am I doing? You know, but I knew that I was playing with an edge and I uh, turned that all around on, on one, on one session actually at the uh, craps table uh, in a casino up North uh, where um, I actually had in that, in the casino about an hour and a half roll. And I, meaning that I held the dice for an hour and a half. Um, I'm not going to say how much money I won, but I can tell you that uh, I had to be walked to the cage uh, with all the chips that were in front of me. They, they, the, the bank of chips that are sitting in front of the dealer, uh, the suit that's behind there, uh, has had to be changed six times in that role, meaning that we emptied out that ra- that that bank six times. They had that's to call for a fill. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I don't so think I've ever lot. seen one emptied once before. Yeah. So it was uh, it was a huge role. It was uh, and a lot of big players were at the table too. You know, that's a big difference between that uh, Patricia DeMarco who had a four and a half hour role, and uh, they only had a chip refill one time. In fact, the most money that was made on that roll was $38,000. Somebody holding the dice for four and a half hours, and they only made 38000 as the most being at that, at the, on that table. And why is because Borgata got so lucky. Everybody at that table were either a $100 or $200 buy-in and knew nothing about betting the game of craps. They were all uh, kids or young people. Patricia herself never threw the dice before in her life. And she started out with a $12 place bet on the six and a $12 place bet on the eight. And she didn't, she didn't even press that six and eight up to $18 until an hour and a half into that role. So, uh, you know, they got lucky. They got very, very lucky. If, uh, Those kind uh, of people, like, we, like, we like to call them ploppies, the people that yeah, don't right. know anything and they just plop down in a chair. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, you know, that was, that was, uh, that was a, how I changed that, that really bad time that I had uh, those 21 straight days. Now, let, oh, wait, go ahead, Steve. Oh, well, I was going to say what, what we'd like to do is um, get in, see you give an example of what you teach in your class. Uh, how, how you set the dice, because you have to set the dice a certain way before you roll them, and your objective when you're throwing the dice. And if you, if you give us an example of that, that would be great. And then afterwards, we want to ask you, uh, bring up some of the objections that sure. people have to uh, control dice shooting, why they think it doesn't work. Then no problem at all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get off of my seat, and I'm going to move the camera around, and we'll get it set up. And uh, we'll be right back. All right, great. All right, so uh, Dom, now we are at your uh, craps table here. We're at the other end of the craps table. And you're going to uh, give us a short example, right, of how you do this? Exactly right. So the first thing that we do here is we try to set the dice in what we call the hard way set. And the reason why we use, and what that means is there are hard ways all around, all four sides. You got I have a hard 10 on top, and then I have the six, and the hard four, and the hard eight. It doesn't really matter what numbers you put on top as far as which hard way you want. You know, it's just your own feeling. If you want to put a hard eight on top or a hard 10, that really it doesn't matter. But during the point cycle, uh, you want to use the same setup all the time because the idea is I'm trying to Uh, throw the dice the same way all the time so that I can repeat numbers. Because that's really the name of this game, is repeating numbers and avoiding the seven. Yeah, so So, I guess guess we should really explain here for those people that don't know how craps works. The objective of craps is you throw the dice. uh, You get handed the dice, you throw the dice. If you... uh, Two, three, if you're on the pass line, two, three, 12, you lose. Seven or 11, you win. Any other number becomes the point. And then you have to roll that point again before you roll the seven to win money. So that, that's why he's saying that you need to repeat numbers. So if he were to throw the dice right now and he throws a 10, the objective for him to win money would be to throw another 10 before he throws a seven. That is a perfect explanation there, Matt. Exactly right. That's the, that's the name of the game. Okay, so let's get that. Now that we have that out of the way, make sure everybody knows the objective of craps. Now, now this might make a little more sense to the uh, people that weren't familiar. Okay, and, and, and let me jump in with one thing here. 
Uh, so when you approach the table, you, you always want to stand in the same spot at the table. And when you roll the dice, you always want to aim for the same spot. Yeah, you know, here we go. You want to you want to stand in the spot that you've been practicing at, meaning that yeah, uh, you don't want to go into a into a battle with a weapon that you've never used before, you know. So the same thing goes with with this game of craps. If I've been practicing with from stick left one, meaning I'm in the first position and I'm to the left of the stick, right where I'm standing right now, that's where I want to shoot from instead of shooting from the end or some other place because I haven't practiced from there. So yeah, you want to go to the same spot that you've been practicing at and there are better spots for people. A right-handed shooter standing, which I am, standing stick, stick left one gives me an easy swing I'm across my body. I can really make a nice little pendulum swing here uh, across my body and the distance from where I'm throwing the dice to the back wall is much less than the distance from the end of the table. Now, what does that really do? What does that mean? Well, obviously, if I have to throw the dice a longer distance, I have to put more energy on the dice. The more energy I put on the dice, the more randomness you might get at the, at the far end. So if I'm standing, uh, if a right-hander stands stick left one or in a left-hander stand stick right one, we just have a shorter distance to the back wall. The other thing we want to do is we want to avoid the hook because as soon as we get into the hook, we call it the mixing bowl. Those dice mix around. By so the hook, you mean, you mean that back corner where the table starts to curve, right? Yeah, exactly right. Uh -huh. You got that mixing bowl and the dice will go around like that. We want to hit on the flat part of the back wall so that they come off the wall, bounce back, and stop uh, right where they are. And, so and the if, again, if, uh, for anyone not for, uh, too well versed at the craps table, if you see the green stuff at the end of the wall, uh, we call that the, uh, the alligator wall. And it's like yeah. the back of an alligator. It's a bunch of pointy triangles. And the idea of that is to, uh, the di it sort of randomizes the dice. It makes them bounce in different directions. So uh, exactly when you right. say the flat part, you mean the part below the alligator or you mean the part above the alligator? Well, no, no, you're going to, I mean, you're going to hit the alligator. Uh -huh. There's no question you're going to hit the alligator. Uh -huh. What you're trying to do is hit the part of the wall that is not curved. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Okay. So right to, you know, where, where I'm going to try to angle to is I'm going to try to hit just a little bit, maybe uh, three or four inches away from where that curve begins mm -hmm. on the back wall. Sort of yep. even with where the, uh, the pass line is, right? If you were to follow that pass line straight back to the wall? That's perfect, Matt. We call that using a runway. Uh -huh. Depending on how tall you are, how much you can lean over, that is, in most people, that, that pass line is going to be their runway, or maybe even the don't pass if you can reach over a little bit further that's gonna be their runway. You wanna throw in a straight line and you wanna throw with a little bit of an arc and, and have the dice land about six, the, for the first bounce, about six inches from the back wall. So it lands on the, about six inches away from the back wall over the chips that might be there from players that are standing. So over the chips, hit the back wall, bounce forward and die. See the whole, the whole thing here, the whole physics behind this throw is real simple. We're trying to put revolutions on the dice. What revolutions on the dice mean is we're trying to turn them. And what we're creating when we're throwing those dice with revolutions is we're actually creating centrifugal force to keep them on access. Access meaning in this particular hardway set, we have a six and a one on, on the side, on the left side, and then here on the right, and a six one. So we have an access here. And we're trying to keep the dice on that axis so that the most perfect shot would be the dice to land with a hardway number. That would be a perfect shot. Why? Because we set with hardways all around. And if we land with hardways, we threw the, the most perfect shot by keeping them on axis. So the first thing, as far as these degrees of freedom I was talking about, is we have revolutions to keep them on axis. Then what we're doing as well is when we pick up the dice, we're starting a little bit of a backswing, so we're putting some energy on the dice. And then as we go forward, 
we're going to give it a 45 degree angle uh, on most tables. And what that 45 degree angle does is it gives you an awful lot of accuracy. You know, uh, if you if you watch football at all, and you you look at uh, Russell Wilson from Seattle. This year, they he's having a phenomenal year. This year, they've been talking more and more about why his his long passes have been so accurate. And the reason for it is, and they've been saying it, is because he puts air on the ball. He puts arc on the ball, and he's got it down where they, it can it it begins to drop exactly where his receiver is to catch it. And that's exactly what we're doing here. Now, when and you when you say 45-degree angle, you mean you kind of want to launch him at a 45-degree angle? So that the apex of the, of the, uh, of the uh, arc is 45 degrees, which is going to be maybe ab- about eight, nine inches above where the rail is. Mm-hmm. And that gives you the most accuracy to get it to a spot that you want to get to. Now, when the dice land, we want to land, have them land flat. Try to get them so that all the, the, the sides land flat onto the tabletop. Why? Because what happens is we have energy when we are swinging and putting it on there. The energy goes into the tabletop and begins to sink into the tabletop, but we always have reverse en- energy. So we have energy coming back up again, and that takes the dice up and hit the back wall, but with not as much energy as the first throw. The first, the the swing is giving it a lot of energy to get to the back wall. When they hit and smack the table, energy into the table gets reduced, but there's still enough energy to get them to the back wall and back down again. We don't want them to die. We, I mean, we want them to hit the back wall. The casinos think that a dice controller, like myself or whatever, are trying to not hit the back wall. We're trying to make the dice land. And at Golden Touch Craps, we are teaching a throw that is a legal throw as far as what the casino wants you to do, meaning they want you to hit the back wall and have the dice come off those rubber pyramids, off the back wall. That is the legal throw. You know, the, the old um, blanket throw that, they, that people used to do in World War I where, you, where they slid the dice along and try not to get them to spin. That's why some casinos have, have underneath the felt, they'll have a piece of metal speed tube. Speed bump, they call it. Speed bump, yes, yeah, so you can't do that. And in the olden days, actually, the first crap tables, you've watched some old movies, old westerns, actually, uh, they don't have rubber pyramids uh, there. They just had a flat wall. But, you know, the, the, the rules of the game is you have to be able to pick the dice up with one hand. It has to be in complete view of uh, the pit boss that's, st- that's sitting down and the dice have to be released and they have to hit the back wall and they have to bounce off the back wall. And that is the golden touch throw. That is what we teach so that we try not to get aggravation from the casinos. Because like I said, if you, if you read their security manuals, and I do, I have them, I can get them and I have them. Uh, they say that dice controllers are trying to not hit the back wall. That's not a golden touch dice controller. We, um, because number one, that's so difficult to try to do to get them to just die without going any further when you're throwing them. We want to follow the rules of the game and so that they can't say anything about us not following the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. So going back to this, we get the dice and we set them with these hardware sets. And then what we're trying to do to get that rotation well, I believe on your example, I think you just rotated one of them, so. Uh, I did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you can see my fingers right now, uh-huh. I'm trying to create a fulcrum, meaning I want the dice to roll off of my fingers. See that? So that I'm creating this backwards rotation. And I'm trying to keep my fingers on the front of the dice as straight as I can. Kind of like that, if you can see that. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're really straight because if I have one finger lower than the other that particular die that particular die is going to stay on that finger longer and instead of rolling off together this one's going to roll off before the other one and we want them to land together to stay together onto the table okay 
So I'm gonna get those dice there and I'm going to actually, I get up a little bit on my toes so that I can lean over a little bit. You know, if I was six foot eight, I wouldn't have to do that. <laughs> so I get them all set up and I grip and I square them with the back wall squared all around. I'm looking at them. I'm a little bit above the tabletop, if you can see that. Mm -hmm. And then I turn my head and I'm looking at my spot on the table and I go into a backswing and I spin them and uh, land. Let's show you. Let's show you that all over again. <clears throat> so again, we're going to set. Now, one th one thing we should mention is that the casinos don't really care if people set the dice because a lot of people set the dice when they throw, and ninety nine point nine percent of them don't know how to uh, actually control the dice when they throw them, correct? Oh, that's absolutely correct. I mean, it is, it is a game where, like I said, the casinos are saying, here, guys, here are the dice, try to beat us. And so, yeah, people are always setting the dice. The funny thing that I, that, that I find funny is people set the dice. And then and shake and, them in their hand. And then shake them in their hand. So yeah. what the hell are you, are you setting the dice for? Yeah, I was, I was actually just going to say that because unlike, unlike Steve, uh, I, I love a craps table. I like to spend a, a, a bit of, I've spent a bit of time in my day at a craps table. Well, you know, there isn't, there isn't a game that is more fun in my estimation. If, if you go around the casino, the game that always has the most screaming and high fives is the crap table. You know, when you're playing a game of blackjack, it's really you against the dealer. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if everybody has standing, and the dealer busts. Maybe the players will high five each other, but that is not any. The, the other players are there isn't one player on the table at a blackjack table that caused that to happen. In a crap game, it is a team game. Most play the, players play the do, meaning they they want the shooter to make points. They're not don't players. Most players are do. So when the shooter uh, is making points and making numbers, it's like, you know, he's the star of the, of the basketball team. He's the star of the baseball team. And I tell people have... that all the time. The, a hot craps table is the best place and the most fun you will ever have in a casino. Oh, absolutely. And when you hit, when you have a long roll, even if it's just a half an hour roll, uh, and I shouldn't say just because that's, that's I was going to say, that's still a pretty long, yeah, damn it, long roll. Know, everybody when it's over with is giving you high fives and it's as if you hit the, the home run in the seventh game of the World Series in the bottom of the ninth to win. Uh, it's just a phenomenal feeling. That, and that's why it's such a great game. I think uh, I had like a 30-minute roll one time ever. I was at the Cosmopolitan in Vegas, yeah, and there were some yeah. people that were betting big there. And I think, yeah. I think they both tipped me 50 or or $100 afterwards. Well, that, happen, that happens a lot, too. I mean, uh -huh. you have players that will tip the shooter over and over again uh, because – Especially if, if, you, if you have some heavy-duty players at the table mm -hmm. and the shooter maybe is not betting anywhere near what these other players are doing, and maybe, you know, they had, you know, $1,000 on the eight and you just hit the, you just hit the eight. Yeah, you know, shooting you, throwing you a quarter, throwing you a $10, or, you know, even people will say, you know, give me a, a hard 10 for the shooter. Uh, you know, somebody who wants to tip. That's actually the best way to tip. That's why we – the way we tip uh, – uh, um, uh, the dealers is we put the money on the line instead of giving it to them so that they can wind up making more money if you uh, make your point. Yeah. So we'll try this again. We're going to grab this over. We're going to set. We're going to look at our spot, get into our throw, and throw the dice again. And now I'm going to just slide this forward so maybe we can see what's taking place. Can you see the dice, guys? I can see one. There you go. Now we can see them both. Okay, so what we did is we threw a six, and what we are trying to do here is we don't want the dice to land way up here. We do want them to land like this, and they're almost exactly on plane. They hit the back wall, and they landed about six or seven inches off the back wall. This particular die, hopefully there wasn't a player standing here with chips because it probably would have hit his chip, and maybe I wouldn't have gotten a six out of it. I would have liked to have this die uh, be behind it like this one is, but that's the way it landed. The, uh, uh, I like to say that uh, 
the Maggio, any long roll has to have a little bit of luck in it. The Maggio's 56 game hitting streak had a little bit of luck. Some of those hits to the shortstop one inch more and the shortstop would have caught the ball instead of having it go past him. And so even with this, uh, you know, you, you, you need a little bit of luck. We, when we try to shoot the dice, we will have friends that we call blockers, meaning this hook, this end of the table where I'm standing right now, and I'm standing behind the four that you see here. I'm, as, if I'm uh, a friend of the, of the shooter who's shooting here, I'm not going to make a pass line bet. Why? Because I want to try to keep this area open for him so that if the dice do roll back a little bit, it doesn't hit anybody's chips. So, shoot, you know, playing this game with friends um, who are shooters, who are learning this game, is what it's all about. And so what? You so you, what? You'd you'd have people standing there just making like what? A place to six, place to eight, something like that. Yeah. Well, again, they'd probably make comebacks as we discussed yesterday before this interview. We suggest always being a comebetter. But uh-huh. yeah, uh, they would just they wouldn't put a pass line bet down. Oh, they'd, they'd just put, wait till the points established and then make a comebet. Yeah, or place to six and the eight if you wanted to be uh, a place better. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's gotcha. that's it. You know, I mean, it's not a big deal at all. In fact, you know, even if the point was a ten. They could, you know, buy the 10 if they wanted to, mm-hmm. um, you know, just to have it out there on, on that point. Mm-hmm. It is more important uh, to have this area open for what just happened, where that four came here instead of here, um, than uh, that friend of yours making a $10 pass line bet with odds and winning 60 bucks if you hit it. I mean, mm-hmm. he, could make the, he or she can make the same amount of money over on the top. Now, okay, so now, now that we have a better uh, view of this, right? So this is, yeah. we can sort of see the alligator felt that we were talking about before where it's, it's these pointy triangles and those, those are uh, what randomize the dice. So that's, that, that's sort of still your variable there, correct? That, that, that's why sometimes it'll bounce a little further or something like that? Well, that is the variable. And that's why, you know, uh, as we said, the object of the game is to try to avoid the seven and it's not going to happen all the time. Sometimes the most perfect shot, or, you know, when I, we're, we're looking at dice rotating together and staying on axis, looking beautiful in the air. Sometimes that most perfect shot, all of a sudden we get a seven and what the hell happened? Well, it's just the way it hit the alligator. That's, that's what happened. Mm-hmm. But remember, random is, is, is a seven every six rolls like Steve said. And all we're trying to do is get better than six point. We're just trying to, instead of throwing a seven every six rolls, we're trying to throw a seven every 6.23 rolls or more. And if we do that with proper betting, just at, just 0.23 better than random, not a big deal, 0.23 better than random, with proper betting, we'll have a 1.7% edge over the house. And as a blackjack player, the best you can get nowadays is a half a point edge over the house, even as a car, as a car car. Mm-hmm. So that's a, you know, that's a pretty big edge. Remember that. Mm-hmm. Dominic, one, one question I wanted to ask you, and I guess to point out to everyone who's watching that concerning the betting as a controlled dice shooter, I, I think a lot of people think that you'd be betting hard ways, make a lot of place bets, but that's not the case, correct? That is not the case. I don't teach, uh, I tell people that you don't want to make those center bets, those hard way bets or anything else like that, only because the edge is so great. I mean, you have, you have edges uh, in the center bets that can be all the way up to 13% against you. Uh, you want to make the lowest house edge bet you can make so that you win the most money. Uh, think of it this way. If, we had a, if, we, if, if there was a bank on either corner of a block, you're going to put your money in the bank that gave you the most interest. And so if you're shooting, as an example, with that one point set, let's make it an even number. You're shooting with a 2% edge, which means that you are avoiding, instead of at 6.23, to shoot at 2%, you're about 6.8. So every... every, Meaning uh, seven every 6.8 rolls, correct? Yes, instead of 6.23. So you got a 2% edge. So what you want to make is a bet on the table that carries with it an edge that is lower than 2%. Do you you follow that? We don't want to make a bet bet that carries a 4% edge for the casino 
because we are going to lose 2% on our bet. Yeah, because so, what, what you're saying is if you, can, if you can get it from rolling a uh, – so if you're rolling a uh, seven every six rolls, the a casino still has an edge over you. If you get it to, what did you say, every 6.8 rolls, uh, that means that you have a 2% edge over the house – if once you subtract out the house edge of the bet that you're making. So if you are making a bet that has a, a, a 1.41% uh, edge, the pass line bet, then you only have a 0.6% edge over the house is what you're saying, right? That's, that's exactly what I'm saying. So okay. with that in mind, the edge on the place bet of the, of the six and the eight has a casino edge of one and a half percent against mm -hmm. You're playing with a 2% edge, you're making a half a point on your money, right? Yeah. Okay. But now if we were a come better, and we made a $10 come bet, and we took uh, just single odds, that edge is down below 1%, 0.87. So now on that 2% edge, we're actually making 1.2% on our money instead of just a half a point by placing the eight mm -hmm. or the six. And so that the, the come bet is the best bet that you can make at a casino. And the reason for it is, is because the casino doesn't take any vigorous off of the odds that you put down. In other words, they pay you exactly what they should pay you if you threw an eight. Instead of taking the vigorous out, when you place the the six and the eight for twelve bucks, and by that he means he means that that's uh, short for the vig, which means the house edge, because that that's how every game in a casino has a house edge. Uh, the the odds bet and craps is the only bet you can make in a casino with no house edge, and that's because in order to make that bet, you have to make either the pass line bet or the don't pass bet with or the come or don't come. It's the same bet. And those themselves have a 1.4 ish percent uh, edge on them. Exactly. So, exactly. Uh, so combine the two bets together. If you have a 1.4 percent edge and uh, another bet with a zero percent edge, you take the average of the two, and that's why that's why he said with a 1.41 percent uh, edge on the pass line or the come bet, same bet. Once you put single odds, it lowers it to the average of the two bets goes down to 0 0.8, and then as you increase your odds behind it and, and bet more money behind it, uh, it gets much more volatile because you're betting a lot more money, but it, your edge continues to uh, uh, go down. Cause I think if you get to, if you get to 10, if you find a casino, I think most of the horseshoe casinos in the country offer hundred times odds. If you're putting a hundred times behind, it's like a 10th of a percent or something, isn't it? Oh yeah. It can be that low, but I always say to people, try to get the five time odds. Mm -hmm. Because the difference between one and five is much greater than the difference from five to ten. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that uh, when I'm playing at a casino that I don't want that I don't take the ten time odds. But I tell my students the key number is to try to get to five time odds. All right, you've given us examples of of how to throw the dice and 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 how you teach your students and examples of how you've had great success. But as always, with anything concerning gambling, there's always controversy. And, and, and dice control is one of the most controversial subjects in the world of casino gambling. So there's a lot of people that really don't believe in it. And, and, and one thing I want to ask, now I know Stanford Wong, who is one of the most foremost experts in blackjack. Uh, in math. He, PhD and, and, in math. I'm sorry? In math. He has a, He's a mathematician. He has a, he has a PhD in mathematics. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the guy's a genius. Oh, but absolutely. Say, he's sort of like one of the godfathers of, of blackjack and, and, and you know, uh, card counting blackjack. So I have a book here back in 2005, because I, I know Stanford, I speak to him once in a while, and we, we correspond. But back in 2005, he believed in uh, controlled dice shooting. And he wrote that book that, that I just showed you, and he had it out there for a while. But he later changed his mind and said he, he didn't think it, it really worked. Uh, now, now, I think part of the theory might have been that he was getting older and he didn't have as much dexterity and he couldn't control the dice as, as well as he, he wanted to. But uh, your thoughts on that? Well, first off, he wrote that book right after he took the class from me. 
Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I think he says that in the beginning of the book that he took uh, the Golden Touch Crafts class. So mm-hmm. he took the class for me <laughs> and, uh, and he wrote that book. Um, anyway, um, the, the, I don't know the reason why he changed his mind being a mathematician, because you can very simply, with math, calculate whether or not you have an edge when you're throwing the dice. I mean, it's a real simple thing, uh, meaning that we call it your sevens to roll ratio, your SRR. You roll the dice 100 times, how many sevens did you throw in that 100 times, do the division and see if you're better than six, meaning six sevens every, um, on the average, every, you know, every 100 rolls or whatever. So every six, rolling, rolling the sevens on the average, every sixth roll. If you get better than that, then you're throwing with an edge. So you can, anybody who thinks that this doesn't work, uh, all, has to, all they have to do is put the time into practice and do the math. And maybe, maybe those people might not ever get an edge. You know, some people are just not that coordinated. You know, I have a student who's actually one of my instructors. Uh, for the, didn't have an edge for two years. That lady and her husband, who passed on now, they practiced for two years straight. They were retired. They wanted something to do together. They enjoyed going to the casinos, and they wanted to they wanted to beat this game of craps. They practiced for two years straight, and that's how long it took them because they were in their uh, late sixties, maybe early seventies, when they uh, started up with us. Uh, it took them that long to get an edge. Uh, some people pick it up real quick. After three months of practicing, they have an edge. Um, so that's the reason. The, the, and people that don't believe it, I've never tried to convince anybody, Steve, of it at all, you know, because the math is there. You can do the math. And as I said to you before, we can argue religion, we can argue politics, but we can never argue that two and two equals four. It always equals four. So if you do the math, when you're, when you're throwing and practicing, or when somebody if somebody wanted to record a hundred of my rolls or a thousand of my rolls, they'll see that I'm avoiding the seven less times than random would. So, but when somebody does say that, I say, you know, fine, don't, I'm not going to try to convince you. In fact, yell it from the, from the hilltops that dice control doesn't work. It only makes it better for me. And let me say another thing to you. If dice control didn't work, why are casinos ban- banned me from throwing the dice? Why am I banned at the Bellagio at 75% of the casinos in Las Vegas? Why am I banned in the whole state of Louisiana, the whole state of Mississippi? Not for blackjack, for craps. Okay, now Matt, Matt's going to bring up some other objections, but before we get to that, what happens when they ban you? What, what do they say? I mean, do they, well, do they say? it depends. What's the most procedure? Of the, most of the time, they're nice. You know, I get a tap on the shoulder. Hey, Dom, can I talk to you? And I know exactly what's going to happen. Hey, Dom, I'm a big fan, and, uh, but upstairs has decided that your game is way too good for us, and we don't want you playing anymore. Uh, other times, they have been kind of mean. <laughs> you know, I've had uh, armed guards around me walking me to the cage. I've had them, um, you know, Bellagio, when they pan- banned me, that was a very uh, tenuous and really sh- terrible situation where – they asked me for papers uh, as if I wasn't a citizen of the United States anymore, that I was, a, I, you know, like you, you're in Russia or China and they ask you for your papers. It's just uh, crazy. That was, you know, so that's based, but most of the time, it's just a tap on the shoulder. Hey, Don, can I talk to you? Yeah. Well, I'm a big fan. They've made a decision. You can't put your game's way too good. They always say that your game is way too good and we don't want you playing here anymore. <laughs> Okay, now I have to I say – so, trespass too. Yeah. But anyway, uh-huh. go ahead, man. Uh, well, I, I have several friends that are uh, in the AP community. They're advantage players. None of them play yeah. dice. And yeah. I love playing crap, so I've always been very interested in controlled dice. And they're all very successful APs, and I've talked to them about it. And yeah. they, their, their uh, rationale is that with the time and effort that needs to be put into uh, learning it and being able to shoot at a degree where you have a good edge, they think that um, it's too, it's too easily countered by the, the casinos. They, they have uh, 
the casino could just ask you to move spots. The casino can, if at night when you're not playing there anymore, after you go up to your hotel room and go to bed, they can close the craps table and sort of adjust the, the pyramids, the alligator skin around. I don't know. I've heard, I've heard all sorts of uh, crazy things uh, that they say, and they just all pretty much say, uh, I'll just stick to card counting. Okay. So, you know, they're card counters and that's great. And I've had a lot of AP card counters that have taken my class that have exactly the opposite view. And I'll say to that, to those card counters very simply. As a card counter today with the rules, you're lucky. Those guys who are definite good players, I'm sure, Matt, mm -hmm. are maybe getting a 0.75% over the house. Maybe there's some casinos around the country that have pretty good rules, very few, but good rules. Maybe they're getting 1%. Maybe they are getting 1% when they're, when, they're, when they're doing that. Well, I say to them, if they can get a little bit coordinated, and get this uh, 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 an SRR of 6.23, which is pretty simple to do with some practice, they got an edge over the casino of 1.7. And now as a come better, just with that one time odds, they got that 1% edge that they're getting with, with blackjack. Mm -hmm. And if they put some more practice in and they get to a, an SRR of seven or eight or greater, I mean, I, you know, I, I my SRR is pretty damn high. Uh, the edge is phenomenal. You're not going to be able to get the same edge uh, as a card counter as you would play in craps. Mm -hmm. And it's that, it's that plain and that simple. I mean, uh, and the casino's doing things, yeah. But, you know, as a card counter, they're, they're doing gonna things. They're going to do just many things. They're, yeah. they're looking at you to leave. They're going to say something to you. So, you know, they're going to do the same shit. Excuse my language. They're going to do the same stuff to you. Um, as a blackjack card counter as they are as a craft player. Mm -hmm. but the edge is going to be so much greater. If yeah, I can, think, I don't know if there was any evidence. I don't know if there was any evidence to it, but I believe the story I heard is that uh, my friend that I was speaking to had a friend that uh, had made a bunch of money uh, shooting dice in a year, in whatever time period and swore up and down that it worked. And then apparently had such a bad run the next year or next time period after that, that he lost it all back. And then, uh, so he might just be a little sour about that. So that might be where that's from. But uh, so anyways. The same story can be said about the blackjack card corner. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, uh, one thing know. I wanted to point out, though, Dom, is that, is that if you're counting cards, the casino doesn't really know you're counting cards until after a while and they follow you. But if you're there setting the dice, it's rather obvious that you're trying to be a controlled dice shooter. So, so that's one thing I, I see right away. They would be aware that you were trying to do it at well, that's not necessarily true either, Steve, because there are so many books out there and so many people that are so-called dice experts that are teaching people how to throw the dice. The casino is very, uh, they're looking, they're, they're, they know you're trying to do something and as soon as you set the dice instead of winging them. And so many people are doing that. And as far as a blackjack card counter is, you know, as soon as they have an inclination, you're right, when he first sits down and just puts out a $25 uh, chip in the box and a hand is dealt, they're not going to know you're a card counter, but as soon as they have any kind of suspicion, what, what, like, you know, what you do 10 against the seven, and then they start following you up on top, they can get, they know real quick whether or not you're a card counter or not. And that's why, you know, you're trying to do camouflage and you're trying not to do the same thing uh, all the time. And that's what reduces the edge. You know, I still say, I'm still saying that, and I look at, I love playing blackjack and I love cards. It's my, Gun to my head. I'd, I'd rather play cards. It just, I grew up playing cards. But the edge that I can get today in blackjack isn't close to the edge I get when I'm, when I'm shooting craps. I mean, just not even close. Um, mm -hmm. Not even close. And, mo and people that have practiced, and yeah, sometimes it takes two years uh, or longer, maybe. Or you know, maybe you'll never get to that point uh, of having a consistent edge. But when you do get to that point with some practice, and I've taught those AP guys as well, but maybe the fellow that Matt is talking about, I, all of a sudden it was in my mind who it might be because of the way he described it. Um, and I think he actually took the, the lesson from me. But the, uh, you're going you're gonna to get, you, you're going to have a bigger edge. Anyway, that's it. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, so that was a great interview, Dom. Uh, you were if great interviewers. people want to know more about you or your class or your books, uh, where can they do that from? It's your website is what is it? Golden touch craps.com. 
www.goldentouchcraps.com. Our phone number is 866-SET-DICE. We will have our new schedule up uh, right around Thanksgiving for next year. If you join our newsletter, you'll get a discount as an early bird special, Black Friday special that we run on any of our seminars going forward next year. And then we have our books, Casino Craft Shoot to Win, uh, Dice Control, Golden Touch Dice Controller Evolution, Cutting Edge Crafts, and um, uh, Beat Blackjack Now, which is our blackjack book on speed count that I see a 12-year-old can learn how to count cards. And then I have a new book that's coming out, hopefully by the first of the year. It's going to be, in my mind, the epitome of all crafts books. It's going to be from from start to finish, how to play the game all the way up to dice control. So somebody who's never played craps before can pick up this book and understand like what you went through in the very beginning of this interview and then all about dice control. Okay. Well, thank you Great. very much, Dom, for uh, joining us today. Uh, if you like the video, give us a thumbs up. Don't forget to leave a comment. Let us know what you think. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button, click the bell, and uh, turn all notifications on so you never miss any of our other great videos. Yeah, thanks again, Dom and Matt, for your time. And everybody, thanks for watching, and best wishes for good luck in the casinos.